So you might have noticed that I have somewhat delayed with talking much about Heidegger on this channel, especially with the new existentialism series dealing maybe first with Sartre or Kierkegaard or even Nietzsche. Uh, but I was waiting, I think, maybe to talk about the lectures of Heidegger before talking about Being in Time. Um, Being in Time obviously is a monumental text in the history of philosophy, but I think that the lectures of Heidegger, especially the more obscure ones like the one I'm going to be talking about in this video, are not merely supplementary to the problems of being in time, but offer super valuable insight into Heidegger's thought as a whole. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about a fairly obscure talk that Heidegger gave called What is Metaphysics? I've looked on Google for translations into English of this work. And it seems that there are a small number of a contradictory, um, or that's the wrong word, different translations available in PDF, which seem to me to be, I think, independent translations by, say, PDF students. The word-for-word -word rendering of a specific sentence is different in each of them. And also uh, something which seems to be um, you know, independently done rather than uh, adhering to a canonical translation of it. So if you're aware of like a canonical translation of this work, let me know. But I'm going to be focusing more in this video on the original rendering in German, which is going to be essential for certain passages um, in Heidegger to understand the way that he's building on certain plays on words. Um, and the central question, of course, what is metaphysics is something which might seem almost futile to ask in the setting of a modern university in which it is understood that metaphysics is not so much something we need to ask about now as it is simply an established discipline from the Middle Ages. The question in here, is metaphysics merely a obsolete discipline full of weird technical terminology from the scholastic era? Is it just the kind of problems of, say, Thomas Aquinas with how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, caricature of medieval metaphysics? Or is it something which, rather than approach it as an established discipline, we should allow ourselves to undergo an experience with it, allow the question to unfold, rather than bringing the question full of presuppositions about what we're interrogating. First, this is maybe similar to the Heideggerian distinction in the later Heidegger between approaching language as the established discipline of linguistics or philology versus allowing yourself to undergo an experience with language. If you would check out my video on the nature of language from the way of language that I posted a few months ago, um, here he's also going to ask, you know, well, the question, what is metaphysics? Is something which it would be more useful maybe to allow us to be transported straight into metaphysics. And of course, if you look at the organization of the modern university, he says that even though there's a number of different disciplines in the modern university organized um, administratively as a series of departments, like you've got the physics department, the chemistry department, uh, the mathematics department, whatever, there's um, still one attitude running through as a common denominator of all of those academic departments, and that is an attitude towards being. And the attitude towards being is one which in German, he talks about adopting a certain attitude as rendered in German by the phrase, wir verhalten uns. And to say, wir verhalten uns is something somewhat idiomatic, meaning both a type of restraint with regard to how you approach being, but at the same time, um, something which takes on an attitude. The idea that the attitude is one of restraint is however contradicted by the idea he speaks a bit later about the way that um, although we characterize science with the attitude of restraint or submission to objectivity, there's still a type of violent breaking and entering of humankind into the whole of being through these scientific disciplines. And the question whether there is a restraint with regard to it or a bursting in German, the phrase pricht auf is the same kind of bursting of, say, um, an ulcer. And the idea that uh, the um, attitude towards being, although claiming to be objective, is something other than that, is in either case something which science as that type of attitude has no use for 
the concept of nothing. Science, even if it is the submission to the objectivity of being, is something which a priori rules out having any concern for the nothing. In fact, you don't even need science to tell you that inquiring about the nothing is worthless. Even logic alone can tell you about something which is not, is um, not only worthless empirically, but also impossible logically. And therefore, he asks the big question, of course, what is metaphysics is supposed to be a talk centered around a question. And that question for him is, um, in German, wie steht es um dieses Nichts? The idea of how does it, how is it going with this being? I mean, literally, sort of, how does it stand uh, with regard to this nothing? But also a more colloquial question that you would ask a person as you do in English. So, how's it going with you right now? You know, how are you doing? And his answer to the question, how's it going for nothing, is not so well. These days, Modern science has no use for it, and in fact, the attitude of science for any academic department is that the nothing doesn't exist. But of course, to say that you can't talk about the nothing, because in German, um, es gibt nicht, is something which you could render in English as you can't talk about the nothing because it is not, right? If you speak German, you know that the colloquial way of talking about there is such and such is eskip, right? It's equivalent to ilia in French or there is in English. So to say eskip nicht could mean there is not. But really here, Heidegger is speaking much more literally about the givenness of the nothing. We could say that science has no use for the nothing because it is not given. And of course, what is given to science is data. Data is simply a transliteration, basically, from Latin for the concept of givenness. And of course, any data um, is data insofar as it's given. That's what rules the nothing out from legitimate um, scientific investigation. But of course, to say that es gibt nicht is not given is something which still leads you to have to ask what is the status of this word nicht, this not? Um, is it the not of a logical negation, the opposite of the logical operation of an assertion, something which in modern logic is simply a secondary um, operation where an operator of negation has to take something else as its operand, which in many ways it presupposes a priority of the givenness of that operand over the work that the operator is going to submit it to. And therefore, he asks, when we talk about eskibnish, the not givenness of the nothing, are we talking about a simple logical negation where we're merely negating something that already is? Or are we rather talking about a different kind of not? a different type of negation, maybe. A different type of nothing is a better word. And he talks about the difference between merely negating something logically and inquiring about der Abgrund. Um, Grund, of course, is the ground in German, and Abgrund is something of a unground, right? A non-ground, an abyss, right? And the abyss is something which Modern science would think that um, is something you can't even talk about because obviously it's not given. But the nothing of the Abgrund is something maybe more of a ground of the other ground of the understanding and therefore more like a ground of sorts for the very possibility of a logical negation, which is an activity limited to the faculty of the understanding. And if the Abgrund is therefore something of more like a ground of the ground of reason, therefore it's not merely one faculty of reason, but something much more fundamental than that. And therefore in German, the talk about es gibt das nichts is something which is different from simply saying es gibt nicht. To say is not is not the same as the um, uh, das nichts 
is given or there is das nicht. This is the difference between merely negating and inquiring about a nothing, which is a fundamental obkund. And therefore, he talks about um, the way that this nothing, although it is not simply one objective domain submitted to this or that scientific discipline, nor is it merely an activity that, you know, the thinking subject has among others at the level of the understanding, is something that we're still basically familiar with. We're familiar with the nothing, even though we try not to think about it in terms of experience. In other words, for Heidegger, the nothing is not so much something which you know by thinking about it, especially subsuming it under, oh, here's the concept of nothing, like in a Kantian sense, that's how I know it. It's more like you are thrown into having conf- having to confront it in experience. And the nothing that you encounter by undergoing a type of experience is something which if you analyze the different types of experiences you have, there are some experiences in which you find yourself in the midst of the being as a whole, not merely interrogating this or that sub-discipline of being, but being confronted with the being as a whole. And the idea of an attunement um, that uh, colors the disclosure of that being at a level more primordial than just falling into, say, a feeling. An attunement is not merely a feeling. It is a certain way of things being disclosed in the first place. Is something which he says, precisely when we are not busied with things and with ourselves, this as a whole overcomes us. And that is in the experience of real boredom. I'm not talking about the boredom of a really boring play or a book. In other words, he's not just talking about the accidental boredom that you fall into when you're trying to watch a really dull film. Like I went to the library a few weeks ago and um, some of Angelina Jolie's films are really good, you know, and some of them really suck because they were more using her um, already established fame to sell a dud um, and people like me bought into it. um, So that succeeded. Uh, But I got like um, The Tourist was really terrible. Um, Tomb Raider 1 and 2 both really sucked. I literally fell asleep. And obviously there are boring movies, right? Um, But that's not the kind of boredom he's talking about. That's boredom that's caused by an object, right? He's talking about causeless boredom. Boredom of the type that is real boredom because it starts when one finds it boring. Now that's a difficult um, phrase to translate into English in the way that he means. In, In German, it's Es ist einem langweilig, and the idea of finding it boring rather than this or that is something which um, shows you that the kind of boredom he's talking about here is the boredom of an an attunement, boredom of what in some English translations of being in time, he talks about the mood that is sort of pre-disclosing rather than merely reacting to the way something is. And this idea that boredom is such a attunement of the Dasein um, that confronts you with the whole is, of course, not to say that boredom is the only such mood. He also talks about joy being another attunement. Certainly, if you're talking about um, this sort of being attuned in which one finds that it is thus and so, that uh, what allows us tune throughout it to be found in the midst of the being as a whole in a certain situatedness of mood is something which in German, the play on words is a bit clear. He talks about um, being found in the midst of the whole as um, befinden, and he talks about the situatedness of mood as unveiling the being as befindigkeit, the idea of finding at some level in both words that your situatedness by mood is how you're found in the midst of the being as a whole is something that leads him to ask, okay, if we can have an attunement, which leads us to the being as a whole, do we also have an attunement to the nothing? And the answer to that is that there is a mood, which you will be familiar with from Kierkegaard of dread. In German, the word is angst. 
the were the the idea of anxiety in Kierkegaard, dread not being the same as fear, which always is fear of an object, just like the real boredom isn't bored by just this crappy Angelina Jolie film or whatever. It's something in which dread is not just caused by a particular object like a really big snake that um, throws you into a state of confusion with regard to lots of different things. If you see a snake, you might trip over something else that you won't notice because you've been thrown into a state of confusion with regard to the network of things that surround you. Dread is not like that. It's not the incidental um, fear of this or that. It's rather the attunement where you have a sinking but not vanishing, as Heidegger cryptically renders it. You have a type of sinking away into indifference of all things and us ourselves. You have the oppression of dread upon us in that movement and also a revelation, but not a revelation of something. Rather, in dread, you have the revelation of the nothing. And this dread that reveals the nothing is something that leaves us hanging because it allows the whole of being to slip away. And the nothing is something which we don't merely find later. It was something which in a certain sense already was there. And therefore, the nothing unveils itself in dread, but as I quote him, not as a being. There is no comprehending it, therefore, since it's not a being to be subsumed under a concept. And yet, paradoxically, in dread, the being as a whole comes to nothing. And there's this talk, therefore, about the activity, for lack of a better word, of the nothing, as in German, die Vernichtung. Die Vernichtung is a... Um, word which, of course, contains within it the nicht, which has been problematic for the entire essay. And it's difficult, therefore, to translate, but one way you could say it is the annihilation of the entire being is something which is undergone in dread. This is a annihilation, as he uses the word die Nichtung, in which, strangely enough, you have um, the situation where, as I quote him, only in the bright night of dreads nothing does there arise the original openness of the being as a being. That is something being and not nothing it is something which, strangely enough, has the nothing as a foundation of its disclosure rather than the nothing being the mere negation of a given being as it would be from the perspective of logic or something which simply has to be ruled out as not even worth talking about, which is the perspective of various scientific disciplines, rather the inquiry into understanding, I'll say that rather than logic, the inquiry into this or that discipline in science is presupposed by the um, presupposition of the nothing and the act of annihilating. And therefore, only on the basis, as I quote him, of the original manifestness of the nothing can the human being here, the Dasein, move toward and willingly enter into something being. For it has its origins in the manifest nothing. Therefore, Dasein is being held out into the nothing. And therefore, the transcendence of going beyond, that is the presupposition of transcendent activities like science or understanding or logic of these things, is something for which the nothing as um, relating to Dasein is what is that what the nothing makes possible in the first place. Therefore, he says, there is no being a self and no freedom without the nothing. Therefore, dread is something which occurs as a type of, um, of, of, of relation to truth in the sense that for Heidegger, in Greek, of course, aletheia is something which 
although we translate it merely positively in languages like English as truth is simply a positive concept, la vérité is simply a positive concept. In Greek, etymologically speaking, it actually has a negative component within it, which is lost in translation. The A at the beginning of aletheia is the same A that you have in concepts like being an agnostic. Agnostic means you don't know. Gnosis is knowledge, and of course we negate that. And if you don't know, that means you don't know if God exists or whatever. Um, we have many other words with that um, at the beginning as a prefix transliterated from Greek. But what aletheia in means in um, ancient Greek that Heidegger shows is not simply the positivity of truth, but rather the not hiddenness of truth. This is often translated as the unconcealedness of truth. And that is why for Heidegger, truth is not simply the um, correspondence theory of here's a proposition that's true and here's a state of affairs that it models. Rather, it is the coming out of concealedness that plays a big role in, say, Heidegger's reading of Plato's allegory of the cave. Things become more beingful as you move up in levels of unconcealedness. They come out of their concealedness. But how is it that the unconcealedness of truth um, is something which is related paradoxically enough to the nothing. As I quote him, he says, the not does not originate in negation as an activity of the understanding. Rather, negation has the not, which originates in the annihilating of the nothing as the basis upon which it rests. The presupposition of truth as that unconcealedness is strangely enough related to nothing and therefore nothing cannot be simply the opposite of truth. In modern logic you take a truth value like t, you negate it and you simply change it to false. There's a relation to truth which is something other than that with regard to we could call it the nothing rather than simply the negation. This is the way that as I quote him um, the leading annihilating conduct within which being here, that's Dasein, remains shaken through by the annihilating of the nothing is something that attunes us to the various colorings of, for example, the sharpness of abhorrence, the pain of refusal, the relentlessness of prohibition, and the pain of renunciation. And therefore, if you encounter sleep, uh, uh, a dread, incidentally, it's not that it only appears at moments of such an encounter. Rather, he says, dread is always here. It's merely sleeping at the moments that you don't find it. But it can reawaken at any given moment. And this awakening of dread that forces you to confront the nothing, which is, I guess, in one sense, beyond being, leads you, strangely enough, back to the original problem of metaphysics in that meta, uh, fusis in the original Greek, um, or the literal rendering of tameta fusica, that which is beyond the physical, although that's a poor translation or transliteration of the Greek concept of fusis, we'll use it for literal purposes anyway, is something which, strangely enough, the question of metaphysics as going beyond fusis has taken us not to the inquiry of the various categories of being in the pseudo-scientific, some would say, sense of medieval scholastic philosophy, but rather has taken us to nothing. The transcendence beyond the question of fusis has somehow taken us to the nothing as the abgrund. And yet nothing and being are somehow related in ways that although are valid, are somehow still beyond the Hegelian conception in the science of logic, that they're both kind of related in their equal indeterminacy and immediacy. Uh, but rather, he says, the relation of being and nothing is that only within the nothing of being here, Dasein, does the whole of being come to itself in a way appropriate to its own most possibility. Somehow, coming in a finite manner, in other words. And therefore, the disclosure of being as requiring unconcealedness is something which um, 
requires a certain area in which it is to be disclosed. And uh, the question of going beyond the physical or going beyond fusis to find, strangely enough, the Abkund of uh, Das Nichts, right, is um, something which he says, although we might disregard it in this or that scientific discipline, we can never really uh, relieve ourselves from the possibility of dread reawakening the question once again.